Okay. I'll let, uh, I'll let Steve get his stuff. I'm going I promise. You're coming back later. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm trying to collect all my things. <laughs> okay. Is this on? Ah, oh, forget it. I'll just take my yes, laptop and I'll come back later yeah, to get it go all. Ahead. Go ahead, start. <laughs> Sweet. So um, I'm not going to try and read out my own title because I realized how complicated it was soon after I submitted it. But um, I'm just interested to know in the audience how many people can understand more than half of that title. OK. That's good. That's about half of you. So that's quite good. That means I'm not, I'm not going to be, uh, hopefully I'm, not gonna, I'm either going to blow all of your minds or bore all of you. I don't know. One of the two. Anyway, so. Um, Basically, I was tasked last year with looking at how we can better realize the location value from high volume, high velocity data sources. Um, so um, I'm from the Ordnance Survey, I should have said that, my name's Jack, and um, we make a lot of data products. Um, one of them uh, that I was sort of investigating for here is one called Boundary Line. Boundary Line is a load of administrative borders for the whole of the UK. Not very fun, but quite useful. And we serve it up as a shapefile. And kind of behind this general message was kind of, are we serving data up in the right sort of formats? Um, how, how much work do you need to do to get it to work with some of the new technologies? So if anyone's wondering why I was doing this at all, that was the kind of uh, reason for that. So the technologies that we wanted to investigate were those that were fast, flexible, and affordable. Um, I'm sure at FOSS, most of us know that nothing is really free. Someone mentioned that in one of the plenaries the other day. Um, so. The kind of uh, default option, if you're, if you're looking for a high volume, high velocity data source, <coughs> is Twitter data. Now, I wasn't really looking to do anything revolutionary with Twitter data. It was more about the technologies and the processes that went on behind it, because I'm sure most of you have seen more visualizations and technologies using Twitter data than you'd care to mention. Um, but it is, it is a really nice data source to use if you want to test a system and see the kind of uh, rapid stuff that comes out of uh, some of the sort of modern uh, data sources. So for those of you who don't know, uh, there's three main bits of a tweet, which are um, some text, uh, a time, and a location. So not all tweets have locations. Estimates vary, uh, but I've seen figures of around 10 to 20% are geolocated. Um, it does depend where you are and the kind of audience you have. Um, I'm sure that will go down as more people become privacy aware, but uh, for the moment, you get that sort of numbers. So what does that mean? Uh, it means given an area covering sort of greater London, which is what I use for my sample uh, size, you can expect to get between 5 and 20 tweets each second. Uh, it does, does vary quite a lot, um, but that creates about a million records each day. So we're not talking big data, um, but it's, it is, you, know, it's quite a, you need a fairly decent system to be able to withhold that and visualize that on the other end. So how do we get that stuff onto our system? Well, I used Ruby. Um, Ruby has a module for every occasion. Um, I realized as I wrote this, these two statements kind of contradict each other. Um, anyone who, is anyone a Ruby developer here? OK. So, so Chunky Bacon is probably not going to mean a lot to you. Um, but basically, Ruby has a load of really nice features that make writing code in it really enjoyable and, uh, and very quick. Um, people say it's written like English language. That's not true. It has lots of weird punctuation all over the place, like all code does. But generally, you can read a line of it. And if you read it out loud, it tends to make sense as a statement, which is nice. Um, and there's a guide that has a lot of mentions of chunky bacon in it, which you know is good. So there's two modules I used, which were TweetStream, um, which is uh, a module for connecting to the Twitter streaming API. Uh, you basically give it your uh, login details and any parameters you want to pass along. And it deals with main opening the connection and uh, serving tweets up to your application, which is quite nice. And then on the other end, I used Sinatra, which is a very lightweight web, web framework, um, much, much simpler than Ruby on Rails. If you just want to get a basic website with some responses up and going, it's really nice for, uh, for doing that and just a few lines of code. So when tweets come through, um, they are supplied as a JSON file. This is simplified. There's loads of metadata and stuff like that. Um, as you can see, this is a live uh, feed directly from this presentation. Um, and uh, you get some coordinates, if you're lucky, um, and you get a time. And um, JSON, this is kind of the stuff that we want to take from the tweet. Um, we, don't, we need uh, <coughs> these main sort of four quadrants. You need a user, some text, coordinates, and time. And that's what we feed into our database. So 
I used uh, MongoDB because it is JSON friendly. So you just fire that same document to it, and it will just create a, a document for you for that tweet. Um, it has some built-in geo capacities. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have used Mongo before, but um, it, uh, especially since the more recent 2.4 update, it's really getting quite good for doing <laughs> spatial stuff. Um, not as fully fledged as PostGIS, but it will do a lot of the kind of ST operations and it does do spatial indexing as well. Um, it also has a flexible schema, which in my opinion is the most useful thing about uh, MongoDB and a lot of NoSQL technologies, and I'll come on to that later. So now you've got all your points feeding into your MongoDB database. Um, what do you do? How do you make sense of that stuff? Well, first, um, I plot the data points. So just, just stream them out and get them onto a screen so you can see what you're looking at, the kind of patterns that emerge. So I use D3 for that. Um, I use D3 because it's web-based, and we were looking to do a web-based visualization technology. Um, it's responsive, so you can make it uh, responsive to different web browsers, different resolutions. You're not talking about serving up images or anything like that. It's drawn on the fly. Um, it has good support for JSON and GeoJSON, so you can fire that stuff straight at it, and it kind of knows how to interpret it. It has built-in modules for that sort of thing. And again, it has built-in Geo, so you can, you can do projections. You can do um, some nice kind of spatial range stuff. Um, and a lot of the examples have a kind of Geo spin on them. So if you're, if you're coming into this new, which I was, um, it's really nice because you can repurpose a lot of the tutorials that the guy who makes this, called Mike Bostock, has made, and other people. So that's really nice. So plotting a lot of points is cool. It looks quite cool. There's lots of stuff going on. But actually, it's kind of an interpretive tool. It's not really that great. You can kind of go, oh, loads of people are tweeting in London. That's really interesting. Uh, but um, what you really need to do is, is aggregate. So you need to do some careful aggregation. You need to pick your attributes and aggregate this stuff up so that you can actually make sense of it. Because a load of dots on the screen doesn't make a lot of sense a lot of the time. So we're really talking about ag aggregating multiple attributes in near time, which is quite a feat when you're kind of getting this kind of 5 to 20 tweets per second, um, especially for someone who's, who's new to this. Um, and what we really need to do to get that to work on the other end, when you're serving up sort of millions of points, is pre-process a lot of this stuff in our database, So um, especially for spatial operations. So I, I, what I wanted to do is make sure that when a tweet came in, I didn't only know the point that it was in, I wanted to know um, I wanted to know the borough that it was in. I wanted to know the, or if I was going bigger, the sort of county it was in, and generally get a lot of that stuff pre-done before I had to sort of do it on the fly, serving it up to the web page. Um, I also wanted to do some keyword analysis on the tweet itself, the text itself. Um, so I strip out all the sort of stop words and stuff like that, so we have a nice clean list of, uh, of words to interrogate. So how do we implement these changes? How do we, you know, we've made our database, we've got our structure in there, um, and now we want to add stuff to it. The nice thing about MongoDB is if you want to add additional fields, you just add them. There's no, there's no predefining of schema, um, which for me is really normal. But um, I, when I was sort of talking to people internally about this, I mean, it might make some of you feel old, but I have never known any other way than doing this. So I had to make some, some sort of traditional relational database uh, tables the other day. And I couldn't understand why you needed to predefine all your field lengths. You know, it's like, why, well, why would you need to do that? And I understand that there's performance benefits for doing that sort of thing. You save a lot of space doing it that way. But I'm, you know, I, I spend a lot of my time prototyping. And the fact that I can just add fields, take fields away, change what's in them whenever I like is really handy for being able to kind of change through a development process. So, um, so I had, as I said, I had a shapefile of some of our data. And uh, I needed to get it into MongoDB. So first, I used another open source tool called OGR2OGR, which is a really nice one-line one um, format conversion tool. Um, it does coordinate transformation, because um, we insist on releasing everything in British National Grid, and uh, a lot of other stuff doesn't accept that. So uh, convert, to convert it all across to um, WGS84. Um, and it has a huge range of spatial formats, so basically, OGR to OGR, you state your format, you state what you want your output file to be called and what you want your input file to, uh, is called, and, and that's it. You just hit enter and it pump, pumps out a file for you. So it's really straightforward. There are loads of other options. There's, there's, it, you know, it's a, a well-supported tool that's been around for a while, but in its simplest essence, that's all it is. So it's really nice and straightforward. Um, then all you do is you do a Mongo import, which is one of the command line tools that comes when you install Mongo. So you, you pick your database, you, you stick in a collection, which is their equivalent of a table, 
Um, you set what the file is, and that's it. It just writes the whole thing in, and it's ready to go. You can create a couple of indexes if you want, which, again, are very straightforward. So what that allowed me to do is, as I wrote, wrote a tweet into MongoDB, I did um, some intersection queries and figured out which, uh, which uh, borough it was in. Um, and, as, as it, and it was very quick to write in. I mean, one of the nice things about Mongo is that you can write in, and it will kind of stack up your writes. It won't, you don't have to wait for a response before you send another write. So when you're talking about quite variable amounts of data coming in, so you know, sometimes you get one or two, sometimes you get 30. Um, it's nice because it can kind of balance that off over, over, the, over the minute or whatever you're, uh, you're writing into it. Um, the second thing was uh, keyword extraction using uh, Ruby. Um, so that was very simple. Um, it wasn't any particularly complex natural linguistic programming. It was just strip out everything that's a smiley face or an its, basically. But um, it worked pretty well. And it gives you a nice list of uh, a nice array of um, words on the other end to query, which again is quite nice because on MongoDB you can do multi-key indexing. So you can index within a document an array. So you can search within an array and you still got that nice fast speed. So what did I learn from this? Um, this is a really cool picture, I think. This is Neil Armstrong in a swimming pool. Um, there's some stuff I took away from this. One of the things was get a simple version of what you're doing working as soon as possible. Um, you'll quickly realize what needs to change. So. Um, for those of you who don't do prototyping, you, you, it, it's, you can spend a lot of time figuring out what you need to build. I find with these sort of technologies, you can actually build something quite quickly and get a straw man up and then go, this is awful, this isn't working. And you can kind of go through that process in you know, a couple of hours and, and get something out really quickly. Um, and it, I find that a lot better for actually figuring out what you need to do uh, and how you're going to go forward. And kind of following on from that, be less protective of your own work. So make clear it's in development and just put it out there to people around you and, and, get, and get feedback on it. Um, I think um, certainly in the design world, which I'm kind of part of, but, um, but also in the development world, we, we can be a bit protective of our work before we think it's ready or finished. And it's quite nice to get that stuff out there in, in a kind of a raw form and get that feedback in. And to support all of that, you pick, on, pick technologies that are flexible, um, even if you have to take a performance hit. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room which would uh, jump up and shout at me how MongoDB is. Uh, really inefficient or something along those lines. But for me, it has a really nice interface. It's really quick to work with. And um, it's flexible, which is really nice for me. Having said that, at the end, if anyone wants to come up and tell me any technologies that I should have used instead, I would absolutely love that. So, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, so um, if, if this is interesting to you, there's three resources that I recommend. So for MongoDB, they have a, a MongoDB University, uh, which is a free course or several free courses um, that they run throughout the year. Um, I did their M101 course um, last year, and a really, really useful course. Um, Ruby at Code Academy, if you want to learn Ruby, um, Code Academy is a great way to do it. It'll take you through some interactive lessons. Um, and again, that's free. And Scott Murray is a really great D3 resource. Mike Bostock is the guy who writes it, so he's also a great resource. Um, and he will respond to things on Twitter if it's something that isn't painfully obvious. Um, but Scott Murray wrote a really good book called Interactive Data Visualization for the Web. Um, which is an O'Reilly book, and I went through that again last year, and that was really, really helpful to kind of getting up and running. Um, all the code is available on, uh, on GitHub. Um, I haven't particularly made it ready for a tutorial or anything like that, but you're more than welcome to go and have a look at it and play around with it. Um, and when it all goes wrong and breaks, uh, my Twitter handle is jharrison, and uh, my website is jharrison.com, and just come and shout at me and tell me it doesn't work. Or if you're not brave enough to tell me your favorite technology here, then please hit me up on there and let me know, because I'm really interested. And that's it.